you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 8. We are continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. I believe we have been in Mark now, I, I want to say, I think it's 32 today. 32 Sundays we've been in Mark. And many of you know that my heart is, is that we don't miss anything in this book. The Gospel of Mark, you'll see the most amazing miracles take place. In fact, most miracles that you see in the New Testament in the Gospels take place in Mark. And so we have seen a lot of those miracles. And again, we've seen Jesus just as late perform miracles even unto the Gentiles, which was just an unbelievable thing for that day. Because again, the, the Jewish people seen anybody outside of Judaism as pretty much dogs, and they considered them a lower class. And here we see Jesus reach out to the Gentiles and feeding the 4,000, and we see him touching the Phoenician woman and her daughter who had a demon in her and delivering her from that. We also see him touch this man with a speech impediment. And, and, and we see him open up his ears. And, and, and again, all these people were Gentiles. And I'm so grateful that Jesus took this time with his disciples, even they, though they were confused at times uh, what was going on, to show them that great commission, even before he actually delivered it to them. He was showing them how to do it. But here we are in Mark chapter 8, and we've seen last week that the Pharisees had confronted Jesus. And again, how many know and that they confront them often? It never does Jesus go to them. They always go to Jesus. And I gave you a reason for that. If you remember in Deuteronomy, I believe it was chapter 18, 13 and 18, you'll see where it actually says in there where they were instructed in the Pentateuch to be careful of false teachers, those people that gathered many people themselves, and even those that are able to perform miracles. And, and this is what the Pharisees were seeing in Jesus. But again, we know that their hearts were hard. We've seen Jesus warn us, and we talked about this last week, the idea of leaven sneaking into His disciples' lives. But how, how did that apply to us? How leaven can sneak into our hearts through uh, legalism and... and, uh, and um, hypocrisy, thinking that we're better than others, or uh, thinking that we have to worship God our way and only that way. And what I mean by that is when we come into the church, here at Momentum, we're very diverse. It's okay to wear whatever here in church as long as it's not drawing attention to you and as long as it's proper. We don't mind if you wear blue jeans and, and tennis shoes and a t-shirt. We don't mind if you wear a suit coat and tie. We, we don't mind what you wear because how many know that Jesus, he doesn't see the outside appearance, but the heart. That's what he's interested in. So we looked at that last week and here Jesus again is spending time with his disciples here in Mark 8 verse 27 through 30. And this might be one of the most important portions of the gospel of Mark. And I'm going to start reading in verse 27. And I'm going to read through the text. And it says this, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on their way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others say, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now I want you to think about this. For two and a half years, right now they've been with him. They have seen him do mighty, mighty miracles. They've seen him do unbelievable things. But it's at this point that Jesus asked them. Not only does Jesus ask them, who do you say I am, but who do the people say that I am? And every one of you sitting here before, if you've been born again, if you have been saved, there was a point in your life 
where you had to ask yourself this question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is a question that everyone, some point in their life, breathes. And what is the answer? Because we are told throughout the Gospels, we are told throughout the Epistles, that there will be false Christ. That there will be false prophets. That there will be those that claim to be the Messiah. So how do we determine who Jesus is? How do we answer that question? And again, the scary thing is, is this, is that everyone is going to have to answer this question. I'm assuming that most of you here, and because I know you, most of you have been saved, and you have asked that question, and that question has been answered. And you have made that decision on this side of the grave to declare who Jesus Christ is. But in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, of Philippians 2, 10 through 11, it makes it clear that everyone is going to have to declare this. It reads this, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of of God the Father. Everyone is going to have to profess who Jesus is. Everyone. I love how Paul just makes it so clear. Not only those that are in heaven, but those that are on earth. And he even goes further and he says, and those that are under the earth. See, this is how important this question is and why we need to pay attention to it. Because in the world that we're living in, there is going to be people that you encounter that ask you, who is Jesus? Better yet, there might be people that ask you, what is different about you? What makes you stand out? Because how many of you know that, again, Many people outside of your impact might not hear of Jesus. That you are God's plan A. You're God's plan A that they might be able to see Jesus in you. I think of this time that our world has went through in just the last couple of days. We left for a men's retreat. Uh, it was early Friday morning. And we drove, and, and I, I didn't have the news on in our vehicle, and we got up there, and as soon as we walked into the Black River Ranch, we were met by someone that was hosting us, and they said, listen, the conference has been canceled. See, we were going to go spend a day at this Black River Ranch in God's creation, but then go to a conference in Gaylord. And, and as soon as that person told me that, it wasn't even like my heart sank. It was just like... Okay, God, you, you know. I'm not going to be disappointed. Because I know who you are. And I know that you're going to show up. And for the guys that went, they'll tell you God showed up. We had a good time that night to be able to share even some burdens that were on our hearts with one another. We were able to pray for one another. And I would encourage the brothers that went to remember those requests to pray for those brothers. But when it came to Saturday morning, we started getting reports because the thing was is this, I had no idea that they had Wi-Fi there and I really, to be honest with you, didn't really care at first because there's times in the position I'm in, in both positions, I just want to get away from my phone. I want to get away from email. I, I, there's times I don't want to have to answer text and I know that might sound rude but it's not it's just I was at that point where I needed just a break but then I found out that they had Wi-Fi and I connected the Wi-Fi and next thing you see is just that grocery stores and even grocery stores close to us are being cleared out not just of water and toilet paper but of their meat racks and and everything else and and you just seen this craziness and how many know that this isn't new? We've seen this before. 
maybe not quite on this level to where it seems to be affecting everyone. But as believers, we know who Jesus is. We declare Him as Lord. But there's a bunch of people that still don't know who He is, and we have an opportunity. You know, I was thinking about this, and this question was asked as we were driving home yesterday. I remember 9-11, when 9-11 happened. I was in my first, first pastorate, and I remember that day, there was not a chair to be found in church. There was no standing room on the sides or in the back of that church. And I remember that day, and it wasn't just our church at that time, but I remember that day all churches were packed. People were shocked. But the problem on that day was this, is I can tell you this, being in ministry as a pastor at that time, we were shocked and rocked too. But see, we can have a difference here. We can show people who Jesus is. Don't panic. Understand who your source of life is. And people will ask you, why are you different? This next coming week, for you that do have work, because I know some of your works even have been canceled. When you go there and the person at the drinking fountain asks you, well, how many rolls of toilet paper do you have? Hopefully you won't share with them like 2,000 or some. I've been telling people we don't have to worry about toilet paper because I have plenty left over from Y2K. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But there's opportunities to share about the Prince of Peace. About the one that gave up his life that we don't have to live in fear anymore. The one that conquered sin and death. I think about this question though, again, getting back in their time frame, this question that Jesus asked his disciples. And I think about what some people say about Jesus, because how many know that sometimes even things that people, they might believe in Jesus, but they might not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, which we know that he is. Uh, there's many people that might see him as a good teacher. In fact, Muslims will actually tell you that Jesus was a prophet. There's other people that will tell you about just his unfailing kind love and how he accepts them the way that they are. And there's some truth to that. But how many know that Jesus doesn't bring you where you are to keep you the way that you are? That Jesus is a, it's a, it's a game changer when he comes into your life. Nothing from that point on is ever the same. And I've got a couple quotes here from people that we might all know here that just have a little different view of who Jesus is. And the first one is Elton John. He says this about Jesus. I love the idea of the teachings of Jesus and the beautiful stories about it, which I loved in Sunday school. And I collected all the little stickers and put them in my book. But the reality is that organized religion doesn't seem to work. It turns people into hateful lemmings, and that's not really compassionate. I think about what C.S. Lewis wrote. C.S. Lewis, many of you know, grew up during the era of pastor during the time of World War II in England. And, and again, I would recommend reading C.S. Lewis, some of his classics. One of my favorite is a book called Mere Christianity, in which I pulled this quote out of. And, and what, what C.S. Lewis was trying to do with this quote is this, is get people to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. To get people to come to the next understanding of who Jesus Christ is. And how many know that that only comes through salvation, the surrendering to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But he penned these words in mere Christianity. It says, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. But I don't accept his claims to be God. Now, Lewis is talking about people that he was dealing with in that day. 
And Luce's response is this, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said this sort of thing that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. You must make your choice. Either this man and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patriotic or patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. So what C.S. Lewis was saying was this, we can't say that he was just a great moral teacher, that that was complete nonsense. What did the Pharisees say Jesus was? Who did they say he was? And we know this because of our study, but I think it's important that we recall what they had to say about him. In Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 22, we looked at this early in this study. It says this, Mark 3, 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by the devil. And by the prince of demons, he cast out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? The Pharisees actually called Jesus Satan. Who else have we seen in the Gospel of Mark that claimed Jesus to be something that he, that he wasn't? It was his own family, if you remember Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, just the verses before 22 where the Pharisees described and said that he was a, from Satan. But his own family, it says in verse 21, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. So we see up to this point two different groups of people, the Pharisees and Jesus' own family, who declared something about Jesus that wasn't true. One said and made it clear that he was from Satan. The other one simply said, he's crazy. He's out of his mind. And we know that eventually that Jesus' brothers came to believe in him to accept Him as Lord and Jesus Christ because we see their words penned in the New Testament. But going back to our text, as He asked His disciples, who do they say? Who do the people say I am? And they said, John the Baptist. The other said Elijah. And the other said a prophet. Well, as I looked into this, I was asking myself, why would they say He was John the Baptist? Why would they say He was Elijah? And I want to look at Elijah. Because there was an amazing similarity between Jesus and Elijah that I seen once I started getting into it. Elijah was a prophet. And he was a prophet known for his prophetic rebuke of Israel, including the leaders of Israel, just not the people. And he rebuked them because of their pagan idolatry and especially of their worship of Baal. He urged Israel to turn from their adultery and follow God, and you can see that in 1 Kings 18.21. Jesus, and I'm showing you the comparison here, He rebuked the religious leaders of that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what did He rebuke them of? And it was simply this, for misleading the people. And also for having an outside righteousness, even though their hearts were far from God. And you can see that in Matthew 23, 1 through 39. What is another similarity? Miracles. They did similar things in miracles. Elijah, he prophesied that rain would cease for years. In 1 Kings 17.1. And then after a long, long period, he prophesied again that the rain would come. In 1 Kings 18.41-45. Jesus calmed the storm. He spoke. 
And the Sea of Galilee became just like ice, like glass, in Mark 4, 35 through 41. What other similarities was there be- between Elijah and, and Jesus? Uh, h- how about the miracle of multiplying food? Elijah multiplied oil and meal for a starving widow and her son, who was willing to share her portion with him. In 1 Kings seventeen fourteen. Jesus multiplied food, loaves and fishes, for crowds who came to hear him. In John 6, 1 through 5, and we've also seen that through our study here in the Gospel of Mark. How about promises to their followers? Elijah promised Elijah a double portion of Elijah's spirit, his anointing. And the seemingly double portion of miracles that Elijah had would be given to Elijah. And another similarity is, is again that Jesus promised his followers a power, an anointing of the Holy Spirit. The last similarity that I seen was this, was the way that they left the earth. Elijah was the only person besides Enoch who the Bible indicates did not die. Instead, he was taken up into a chariot of fire. and He was caught up into heaven in a whirlwind as Elijah watched. Jesus ascended into heaven into the clouds as his disciples watched. As we studied on Wednesday night in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Why did they say that he was John the Baptist? And again, I, I'll just remind you again of our study earlier. Uh, again, we have seen Jesus twice in our study of Mark, who, he, again, when he went into Gentile territory, the theologians actually believe that he did that to outskirt Herod. And we know that in the Gospel of Mark, we also know that Herod at one time requested that Jesus come to him, come to visit him, with the idea that he was going to kill him and destroy him. So we know that Jesus had taken, again, not, again, I want to make something clear, God was in control. But Jesus used wisdom. Jesus knew that his time wasn't yet. So I, I think of the situation we're in today. <laughs> we shouldn't be a fear, afraid, but we should be using wisdom as the Bible conducts us. But Jesus, again, he outskirted them. And again, we know why is because Herod was out to get him. In fact, when Herod beheaded John the Baptist, when Jesus came onto the scene in a big way, Herod actually believed it was John raised from the dead. In Matthew 4, 14, 1 through 2, Matthew 14, 1 through 2, it says this, And at the time Herod heard the reports about Jesus, he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. And again, we see in Mark 6, which we already looked at, again, Herod also being so concerned that Jesus was John the Baptist being read, raised from the, the grave. And again, Herod even says this in Mark 6.16, 6, but when Herod heard it, he said, John, who I'm beheaded, has been raised. So this is why some people said that Jesus was John the Baptist. But we see Jesus in this passage, passage that we're looking at gets very personal with his disciples. Because he's not just talking to Peter, even though Peter is the one that speaks up. Peter was the one that always spoke up on behalf of the disciples. But he made it very personal. And I want to just reread the text again. He says this, And when Jesus went out with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do the people say I am? 
And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say the prophets. And this is where it gets very personal. And he asked them, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? I want you to imagine this. He, he said, who do you think I am, Peter? Who do you think I am, Andrew? Who do you think I am, James? Who do you think I am, John? How, how about you, Philip? Who do you say I am? Bartholomew, who am I? Thomas, Matthew, who am I? Who do you say I am? Thaddeus and Judas, what do you believe about me? What would you say I am? And we see Peter, he rises up. Why is this important that you know who Jesus is? Why is it so important? If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're not saved. You are lost. You are blind. You are dead, the Bible says. But why is it so important as Christians, as believers, to know who Jesus is? We live in an age today where religious tolerance and morals is everything. We are taught that we should coexist. How many of you have ever seen those sisters, those stickers, co coexist? And I, I'll be honest with you, every time I see one of those, it kind of gets under my skin. Again, we are to be peaceable to all men, the Bible says, as it depends on us as believers of Jesus Christ. So I'm not talking about raising up arms. I'm not talking about uh, being offensive because how many know that the gospel in Jesus Christ alone is offensive? We don't have to be offensive. You speak the name of Jesus enough, it will be offensive to people. But we, if in this world that... There's this popular spiritual philosophy. I go again back to September 11th. And this is where I've seen a highlight of this, where all belief systems came together. And everyone was one. We seen unity during that time, didn't we? Unity like I'd never seen in my lifetime before. Probably a time before that was World War II, where people, they were united in such a way. But don't, don't be fooled. Not all unity is of God. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? Not all unity is of God. The devil is happy with unity as long as it's incorrect doctrine. He likes it when people get together and they agree on something that's not right. We need to truly examine who Jesus Christ is. This is one of the most frequently asked questions in our world today. Who is Jesus? And the Bible unfolds those answers. Witnesses unfold those answers. You and I unfold those answers. So who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to what we believe here at Momentum Christian Church? I'm going to share this with you right now, what we truly believe Jesus Christ is. According to John chapter 1, verse 14, it makes it clear that Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We believe that Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry here on earth was 100% God and 100% man. And why do you say, why is that important? Because today we have a big, rapid teachings out there that has started probably about five, probably anywhere eight years out now. And I know many of you are unaware of these teachings. Because again, you might just come here Again, you might just read your Bible, but as a pastor shepherd, it's my job to make sure that I'm aware of these things. But there's a teaching out there that will tell you that Jesus was just a man when he was here on earth. 
And therefore, we can do everything that He did. And that includes living a sinless life. That includes doing all the miracles. It's amazing to me with this coronavirus going on. I I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this. But some of these biggest groups that claimed this, that Jesus was just a man who have healing houses, have closed their healing houses. Doesn't that seem strange? Isn't this the time to have healing houses open? I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. But we believe here at Momentum Christian Church that Jesus Christ was 100% God, 100% man when He was here on earth. And that now He's at the rightful place of God the Father. We believe, again, I showed you that He was 100% man, but we believe He's 100% God. According to John chapter 1, 1 through 3, it says Jesus existed from the beginning. We know that. How many know that Jesus was creative when the world began? How many know that Jesus was there through the whole Old Testament? I think of his time as 100% God, 100% man here. The miracles, the eyewitnesses, the fulfillment of prophecy again and again and again. Jesus, he declares his own identity. In John chapter 10, 30 through 38, we see this in Matthew 16, 13 through 17. We see it in Mark 14, 61 through 64. We see that he proclaims this to his followers in Hebrews 1.8, in Colossians 1.16, in John 12.40. And he does it while he's quoting Isaiah 6, 1 through 10. We see that Jesus was 100% God because he was the only one to ever rise from the grave. The only one who's claimed to be God that actually is risen from a grave. We believe here at Momentum Christian Church that Jesus is the only way. And the only way to heaven. See, there's other religions out there that will mandate and tell you that there are other ways and that their God will allow you to go to those ways. But uh, how many know that those gods, they institute that you do work? Those gods never rose from the grave. Those gods, their burden is heavy on the people that are their followers, those little G-gods. But Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. In John 14, 6, Jesus declared this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why is this so important to know? Because no other religion, none of the leaders throughout history ever made this claim. Never. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says this, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift from God. Not by the works, so that no one can boast. Again, this is so contrast to the little G-gods. Little G-gods that make you do certain things, make you do this and that, make you do things that are unheard of and and heavy weights. So who is Jesus? I think it's important that we ask ourselves this question also. Who am I? Who am I? Because I have to believe you're sitting in church here today for two reasons. And it's because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And, and you know what the Bible says about church. Yesterday at Steve's grandfather's funeral, it, it was a beautiful part of that funeral. And I, I let Steve know this last night. 
Because the pastor of that church said this, that Steve's grandfather showed up to their church two years ago, 2018. And in 2018, Steve's grandfather gave up all his anger and probably even hatred towards the church. I can't tell you what happened to Steve's grandfather. I, don't need, I can't even tell you if he was attending the church his whole life. He just seen church folks that claimed to be something that was far from what they were professing. But two years ago, what happened was this. God moved upon Steve Provo, our worship director, to share Christ with his grandfather. I'll never forget the weekend that he went up and he told me, pray for me, ask for the Holy Spirit to give me boldness because I'm going to be sharing Lord with my grandfather. You know what? That weekend, Steve's grandfather accepted Christ. And yesterday at the funeral service, they actually had one of his songs that he had written and had on paper. But Steve's grandfather, after that, wrote many songs. And they said every time the church doors were open, Steve's grandfather was there. Every movie night, Friday night, and I don't know what their movie nights consisted of, but every Friday night, Steve's grandpa was there popping popcorn. He was there on Sundays serving as an usher and a greeter, just loving on people as they come to the church. See, Steve's grandfather had come to a point in his life where he had to ask himself, who is Jesus? And because of that, he's in heaven today. But I'm assuming that you've all made that decision, whether you're watching online or sitting here today. But again, maybe you're here for other reasons. Maybe it's just because you've always come. Maybe it's because you have a friend here. Maybe it's just because that's what you've always done. You know, I'm so grateful, and, and I'll keep it down just a little bit, but, you know, it's so awesome when somebody gets saved and, and just recently, Jaden went to a youth group function, and, and we've been praying for Jaden uh, in prayer a lot. And I've been personally praying for him, and, and he accepted Jesus Christ a little over a week ago. He had come to that question, who is Jesus? And I'd encourage you today, I'm going to have you stand. I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. The main question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And again, I don't want you to ask yourself, who is Jesus to you? Because how many know that we can have different pictures of who Jesus is or an incorrect view of who Jesus is? It's kind of like yesterday. I was so glad that we were like-minded. Uh, how, how many remember Ponderosa restaurants? Okay, if you talk to my wife, she just so disdained Ponderosa when it was at 23 and Gratiot. But me and my brother, it, it, that was like fantastic. Their chicken wings were just out of this world. But yesterday when we left the funeral, we didn't have no breakfast. We were starving, and I looked at my phone, and it was like, ah, there's a Ponderosa just up the road, and everybody was in. I didn't hear anybody say, no. So I was glad I was with like-minded brothers. But how many know some people have different view of Ponderosa? I didn't get a steak there because I just I knew I'd be disappointed. But man, I love their wings and that ice cream fountain. We have to have the correct view of who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He was 100% God, 100% man. He is our Lord and Savior who paid a price on a cross in full obedience that we might have life and life everlasting. He's the giver of life. And listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ today or maybe you've asked yourself that question, maybe you're sitting here today or maybe you're out there watching the live stream and you've Maybe said to yourself, well, maybe I've only believed him as a good teacher. Maybe I've just seen him as, uh, as a historical figure that did good things. 
Maybe I just seen him as a healer. Maybe I just see him as a flashlight. And for you that are not new to Momentum Christian Church, I say often we treat Jesus like a flashlight. When we hear the bump in the night, we pull the flashlight out. But if there's no bumps in the night, it stays in that drawer and doesn't get used. We don't think about it until an emergency comes up, until the coronavirus comes up, and next thing you know, we're pulling out Jesus. Listen, Jesus Christ wants to be Lord of your life. And he is a loving Lord. He's a Lord that loves you enough to not keep you the way that you are, but to bring you into newness of life and to give you life everlasting. So listen, I'm going to pray. And maybe today you want to take that step from making Jesus just a moral person, a good teacher, just a a prophet, uh, somebody maybe that you've compared him to like they did the people that day, Elijah and and, and, uh, John the Baptist. But if you want to take that step to declare him as Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow our heads. We're going to pray. But I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you as we're praying to just make your way up here because I want to talk to you. I want to share with you about who Jesus is and what he's done for you. I want to make sure that you're clear because I think in a way that we've made some really bad mistakes here in the Western world where you know, we're, we're told we're supposed to profess Jesus, that we're supposed to, again, declare Jesus. And, and this is how we lead people to Christ. Bow your head and raise your hand. And repeat after me. I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. Nowhere. Many of us have come to Christ that way. Can we say amen? Only to recognize him later of the true Lord and Savior in our lives. So let's bow our heads this morning as I pray. Father, I just thank you for our time together, Lord. I thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, I thank you for this question that you asked your disciples. Who am I? Because that question rings throughout the years. Today it's ringing in our ears. Who do you say Jesus is? Father, we declare today at Momentum Christian Church that you are Son of God. You are the King of Kings. And I think about the two verses that I I didn't look at this morning where Peter, after you declare who you are, you tell them not to say anything, then you tell them how you're going to suffer. And and Peter just does something that the Greek makes clear is just madness. Almost makes Peter crazy. He calls you over to rebuke you. And those words are spoken, get thee behind me, Satan. Lord, cause us, Lord, not to be those that rebuke you, but love you. Cause us, Lord, not to question your love for us, your care for us, Lord, your discipline for us, but cause us, Lord, to embrace it. So, Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here that has asked that question, who is Jesus, that they'd come forward and speak to me. Lord, that they'd speak to another believer here about you. And Father, I just ask that you just go with us today and cause us, Lord, to live out in our lives who you are. And this next week, cause people to recognize Jesus in us or cause them to see a powerful form of love. And when they ask, how can you be this way? How can you reach out to me this way? How can you be so kind that it simply quickly comes off our lips, lips that it's Jesus Christ and Christ alone? So, Father, I just ask, Lord, that you go with us. Keep us safe. Lord, as we go on, Lord, keep us until we return. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.